Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're about to start and can I thank you all for coming to this special session this afternoon and in particular I want to welcome our Minister for Education and Skills, uh, Rory Quinn. And I also want to welcome our special guest of honour who is going to deliver the Edward M. Kennedy Lecture. Uh, his son, Ted Kennedy Jr. So while Ted is a, making his uh, way to, to the stage, just to say that my name is uh, Peter Castles, and I'm the executive director of the Edward M. Kennedy Institute at the University of Maynooth. And again, I want to welcome you all and to thank you for coming here this afternoon. But before we start proceedings, uh, yesterday on uh, two occasions I heard Ted, or in fact your family keep calling you Teddy and your, your cousin last night, uh, Rory, was calling you Teddy. So I think we'll embrace you and call you Teddy, since you're now part of the New Ross family here. So I heard Teddy. Uh, I heard Teddy yesterday twice, once on uh, Sean O'Rourke and RT in the morning, and later on with uh, George Hook, uh, talking about Minute and the Kennedy Institute. So I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Anne Ryan to say a few introductory remarks to the lecture. Uh, Anne is a chair of the Department of Adult and Community Education at NUI Minute, but she's also a co-founder of the Edward M. Kennedy Institute and its academic director. Um, one of the things, Minister, that you will be interested in is that uh, Anne has been involved in designing a, and working on very innovative programs to bring uh, primary education to girls in Afghanistan and in Bangladesh. And you know how difficult it is in terms of <coughs> Afghanistan to provide for education for, for girls. And she's been leading programs there for a number of years. And she's currently working in Malawi and Zambia on climate change with local food producers, again to see how she can link them up with agricultural scientists and climatologists to ensure that the whole climate change does not wipe out their farming practices. So it gives me great pleasure to ask uh, Professor Anne Ryan, the co-founder of the Kennedy Institute, to say a few words. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm very overawed to be on a podium with such illustrious company. Uh, but my a task for this afternoon is to just give you a, a brief overview of the Edward M. Kennedy Institute for Conflict Intervention and just to say a little bit about what we do and why we are very happy to have that name attached to the Institute. Um, the Institute is now about two years old and when it was set up we had two very clear aims. And the first one was to, I suppose, to better understand the more subtle reasons why there's conflict. And the view in understanding it was also to understand how communities and groups go past conflict. What is it that lets them go beyond it? So we wanted in the Institute to work with groups and communities that were in conflict. And we figured we had a great deal to learn from them. So we wanted the institute to be set up in a way that the, the academy or the university could make whatever knowledge it had available, but could also enhance its knowledge by talking directly to communities and groups that were experiencing conflict or had experienced conflict with a view to, I suppose, enhancing knowledge in relation to conflict. 
And with that aim in mind, we run a number of courses. And there are courses to do with mediation, there are courses to do with uh, restorative justice, and to do with peace and, and building security in areas that are war torn. And I suppose coming to setting up this institute, my co founder Robert Gallivan and I, we had some experience working in some far flung places that Peter mentioned a few, uh, and also closer to home. We've done some work uh, on cross border initiatives in uh, Northern Ireland, and we've done some work in various communities that have difficulties in uh, Fesha Carr and Clondalk and uh, around the country and other places. And we'd work with particular groups, uh, groups of travellers, people with disabilities. We'd worked with the Defence Forces. We'd worked with prisoners in prison education. We'd worked with business executives. We'd worked, uh, well, we'd worked with a number of groups. And we had learned a lot from them. And we learned that in areas of strife or difficulty, and particularly where conflict ended up with a violent reaction, there tended to be three characteristics that were almost always present. And they were poverty, inequality, and unemployment. And whenever you found those three things, differences, and things that maybe could otherwise be dealt with tended to lead to conflict. So, with that understanding, we also had a second aim in, in setting up the Institute. And that was to look at how would you create a society where you minimized poverty, unemployment, and inequality. And it was in relation to that aim, which I suppose in a way brings us into the area of the vision, uh, which sometimes I think we shy away from. But there was a notion that we would try to make, look to see what could we do that would vision a different kind of world, but also how would you realize it? And that was the big challenge. And that is an area we continue to work on. I can't tell you we've worked it all out yet, but it is the one I think we feel is most worthwhile to struggle after. So in relation to those two aims of allowing people who are engaged in conflict to come together, not just the two sides of a conflict, but people who have similar experience of conflict, come together to talk, to learn from each other, and to, to help us to understand so that we can make whatever courses, whatever research we do more relevant. And that other vision of, of uh, that other uh, aim of visioning something. And it was out of that that we were more than happy to be associated with the name of uh, Ted Kennedy, or Edward M. Kennedy, to give him its full title. And he was someone who we wanted to honor, not only for his work in Northern Ireland, his incalculable work in Northern Ireland, but also for his commitment, and it was a lifelong commitment, to social justice, to equality, to promoting equality, to issues to do with the environment, which are very much part and parcel of any issue to do with equality. Um, but I think more than anything else, all of those things were very important. We were very aware of his ability to articulate a future where the causes of conflict, no matter how ingrained they were, could be transcended. And I think it was that hope, that inspiration, that um, we found, for us, very inspiring. And I think we also hope that that kind of vision is one that we could play a very small part in realizing. So the Institute is now, as I say, two years old. 
And I can't think of a better way to mark the occasion than with this uh, lecture. I think we're particularly thrilled to have Teddy Kennedy here with us, someone so close to uh, Ted Kennedy. And we're also delighted to have the Minister for Education and Skills, Rory Quinn, and I do appreciate him taking the time to come here to respond. So without further ado, my sincere thanks to both speakers for coming here today. Thank you. Patrick, also his aunt, uh, Jean Kennedy Smith, but also especially as well, Kiki, his uh, wife, and we're glad has been able to return here with him uh, to the summer school. And I want to thank uh, Ted and his aunt, Jean, for accepting the proposal from the government at the time that the institute be named in honor of his father. Uh, Ted, as many of you know, is a, a lawyer. Uh, in his early days in law, he specialised in particular in the whole area of disability issues. Uh, he's also a co-founder and president of the Marwood Group, uh, a firm which he established and which advises on the whole area of, of healthcare. Uh, he's a board member of the American Association of People with Disabilities. Uh, and many of you will remember uh, the much praised tribute that he gave to his father at his funeral in August 2009. So it's my great pleasure now to invite uh, uh, Ted Kennedy to deliver the inaugural Edward M. Kennedy Lecture. and also your leadership in, expand, in establishing the Edward M. Kennedy Institute at Manu. Um, I also want to, of course, uh, thank you, uh, Minister uh, Rory Quinn, for your presence here today, and thank the people of New Ross and the uh, participants of the, uh, this three-day seminar, the Kennedy Summer School, which is part uh, educational, uh, celebratory remembrance ceremony and academic institute. I think it's really fantastic that so many, the caliber of the faculty that are involved, uh, the leadership of so many people, it really is an honor for me to be asked to be with you today and also an honor for me to be asked to deliver the inaugural Edward M. Kennedy uh, lecture uh, sponsored by um, Maynooth University. Um, so my goal here today, uh, this afternoon, I know we have uh, some time together, brief time together, is um, to reflect a little bit on um, my uncle's presidency, the Kennedy legacy. Of course, you can't do come to New Ross uh, and in, in 2013 and not uh, and not reflect on um, on the legacy of of, uh, of President Kennedy. Um, and to make a, a, a few personal observations as a younger member of the Kennedy family. And also I wanted to reflect on, since this is the inaugural lecture uh, of uh, the Edward M. Kennedy Institute, uh, I figured, well, what better uh, can I do then to also make some uh, selected uh, passages, readings of some selected passages in my father's book, True Compass, it was his memoir, um, and it's uh, and what are my favorite stories, in other words. Um, so I just am I'm so grateful um, for the friendships that my father developed here in Ireland, at Manu, in New Ross, and with the Irish government, many leaders in the Irish government that continued throughout his life. He, my dad had a tremendous amount of respect for the Irish people, and I think and love Ireland and the people here, and I, I, I just want you to understand that the feeling is mutual, the, the outpouring of, of, of uh, friendship and of love for the Kennedys, we feel the same way uh, for the people of New Ross and for the people of Ireland as well. Um, so um, I also just want to, by way of brief introductory remarks, thank you, Peter, uh, for your leadership. Um, and of course, Anne, Frank, Frank Fitzmorris, thank you for everything you're doing to make this institute 
a reality. Uh, Noel Wheelan, uh, the directory, the director of the uh, of this summer school, thank you for everything that you're doing. Also, with, in your capacity as the chair of the JFK Trust, um, I'd also like to thank my cousins, uh, Patrick and Siobhan, uh, Brennan. You all know them as uh, as as your neighbors and friends. Um, and so again, I'm just so. Um, inspired by the quality of the faculty that is that is presenting here today on such a wide number of topics. It's so interesting, um, you know, how Irish immigration shaped U.S. history, but how it also shaped Irish his history as well, and what we can learn from the national debates on immigration today. As you know, immigration is a hot topic in American politics. And if you listen to the rhetoric uh, that confronted uh, I, the Irish when they landed on the shores in the United States. It's not so different from a lot of these same political arguments, a lot of these same social questions that we are debating right now in the United States and also other countries uh, in the developed world as they accept uh, 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 new entrants into their society. So, yes, there is a focus here in New Ross on, obviously, on my ancestors, but uh, their story is really no different than the stories of thousands of other uh, others who boarded the famine ships right across, right down on the on the quay here. Um, you know, people living, giving up everything they they knew <laughs> to uh, to improve their lives and willing to risk everything they had. I don't think I would have had the courage to to board one of those ships. Um, and leave everything I knew uh, behind. Um, so uh, thank you again to Manu. My family is really so honored, so honored for this incredible gesture, recognition, and commitment on behalf of the Irish government, the Irish people, the business community, and most of all, Manu. Um, the Kennedy Center for Conflict Intervention, it's going to, we think, promote better civic engagement, participation in the democratic process, promote nonviolent social and political change. That is something that my father believed in, and uh, there's no question that this institute is already on its way to becoming a world-class center in a world-class university with world-class faculty. Um, so thank you so much. Um, and my father often spoke of me. In fact, when I was uh, in Ireland about 10 or 15 years ago, he, my father knew I was coming over. He said, you know what, you should go out to Manu. And I have to admit, I hadn't heard of Manu, okay? And, I, and he said, it's a terrific, oh, it's lovely, and it's when they educated uh, all of Ireland's priests. I don't know whether that's true, that's what he told me. <laughs> all the smart ones, anyway. Um, but anyway, he, he, uh, he said, I, I think, you know, out of all the institute, the places that this institute could be housed, I think he'd be uh, so proud to have it at the new because of the idea of communitarianism that, that permeates the halls and dormitories and its philosophy of education at the new. And communitarianism is the idea that we're all part of a greater society and that the goal of education is not just to enable personal success but to promote future leaders who will work towards political and economic fairness for everyone. So again, thank you so much um, to, the, uh, to, to Manu. Uh, to Patrick and Siobhan uh, Brennan, uh, and to the people of New Ross, again, thank you so much. Again, you've heard uh, my family say, my President Kennedy said, you know, being here um, 50 years ago was the best four days of, his life, of my life. That's what JFK said. And it really is true. Our family feels that and continues to feel the outpouring of love and affection that the people of Ireland have shown. Um, so again, um, I want to just take a few moments and read uh, seven or eight selected passages of uh, my father's book, True Compass. Uh, many of you know he, uh, he worked on this book uh, throughout his life. He took meticulous notes. And some people think that's you know strange that Somebody, how, uh, uh, how, considering how busy he was, would take time to write things down. But he did. Uh, he knew that he was going to write a memoir one day. He recorded meetings of all of his important legislative debates and, uh, and meetings with leaders in the U.S. and around the world. Um, 
And he wanted to tell his story. Uh, that was clear. Um, so uh, there are a couple of things that really surprised me about this book, and I'll, and I'll, and I'll share some light on that as well. But um, uh, he really wanted, you know, what, what was her, his household like? What kind of environment did my father grow up in? And of course, my uncles that enabled uh, and led to their success. And what were the secrets to his legislative success? Um, my father was really not introspective in his life. He, there were a lot of uh, things that confronted him, a lot of tragic experience that he had to deal with uh, that he didn't really dwell upon. My father really believed in living in the present and thinking about the future. He didn't really spend a lot of time thinking about all the bad things that happened to him uh, during his life. Um, so I just, um, I just, uh, I was really struck after I read it. Of course, no author will allow you to read their book, right, while it's being written. At least that's my experience. My father didn't show me the manuscript. Um, I read this book. I, he, this book was delivered to him in its final form, actually on the day he died. He was uh, presented with a, a final copy of the actual book. Uh, the, the day that he died. So I know that he was very proud of it. Um, and uh, anyway, I just wanted to, um, of course, it, a lot of people who like the Kennedy family or uh, political junkies and, 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 and whatnot will love the book, but it also details a lot of my father's work in his human rights struggles around the world and about his philosophy of life and about his politics. And just to make <clears throat> a couple of brief remarks about his political philosophy because it really did shape how he thought, the way he confronted the, the problems that, that he, as, he, as they presented themselves to him in the United States. Um, uh, as for his political philosophy, it's very simple. He was a proud member of the American Democratic Party. And uh, for my father, what that meant to be a Democrat uh, meant being guided by Principles of basic fairness and the collective good. Um, he, uh, it also meant having sympathy and compassion for other people and putting government to work to help people who need it and using all available tools of government to provide safe neighborhoods and good schools, clean environment and food safety, a living wage for an honest day's work. These were things that he considered basic fairness. It meant standing up for other people and making sure that all people are treated fairly and with respect and dignity. He believed that America was stronger when there was a lot of social mobility in our society and not when there exists a two-tiered economic system and structure separating the very wealthy from everybody else. And he spent his life fighting for student aid and health care and child care and food assistance and of course uh, civil rights around the world. One of the areas that I got to work with my father on is the area of disability law, which uh, basically holds that people with disabilities deserve the same rights and opportunities as everybody else, and kind of piggybacked on the other movements that took place in the United States, the women's movement, of course the civil rights movement of people with color, the gay rights movement, and then people with disabilities framing their issues not as uh, for saying not, not looking at people with disabilities with sympathy or with charity, but with people who've been left out because of no fault of their own. And using those same types of framework, uh, civil rights framework, to uh, promote their own causes. So um, also my father's credo, even though he fought like hell for what he believed in, and he did, um, he was never afraid to cross the aisle and, and, and work with his sometime political adversaries if he thought that progress could be made on an issue. So to him, compromise, consensus, accommodation, these words were not dirty words to him. Um, in fact, he thought they were necessary. And he thought that people shouldn't go into government if you can't compromise and you can't Look at, if you're incapable of understanding other people's points of view, you shouldn't go into government because that is what is needed in government, are people who, can, who have their principles but can also try to find the middle ground uh, when, when progress can be made. And he was able to take that point of view 
because he was in it for the long haul. You all know he served in the Senate for uh, 47 years. He felt he had time. If he didn't get everything he wanted in one piece of legislation, that's okay. In fact, he would tell me sometimes on the, on the, after making a vote on, the, on a particular piece of legislation, he'd be walking back to his office already thinking how he could tweak the, the legislation to improve it the next time he had a vehicle that he could pass something. Um, so he was always thinking, and the other thing that I think was a secret to my father's success were the personal relationships that he developed. You know, it sounds really simple, but it's true that to succeed in life, it's all about developing personal relationships with people. And, um, and he felt that part of the reason he was able to be successful, and it's true, because you hear other people in Washington talking about it all the time. People miss uh, my dad in Washington, and the people who miss him most of all are, are the Republicans. They miss him most of all. Um, believe it or not, it's true, because he was there when they did a survey on who was the Democratic senator that they would most like to work with. Every year they surveyed the Republican senators, and his name was always at the top of the list because they knew they could develop, they knew that if he told you something, his word was as good as gold. And when he shook your hand and said, we've got a deal, back we could take to the bank. And, um, and also he, he invited people over to his house for dinner. I remember uh, people like Paul Laxalt and Senator Simpson and even Donald Rumsfeld, you remember him? Donald Rumsfeld. <laughs> My father uh, was friends with Donald Rumsfeld in the 1970s. He would come over and, and play tennis. My father, he was a really good tennis player. So that's, I think, one of the reasons why my father wanted to invite him over so he could be on his team. Um, but the point is, is that, and Senator John McCain, of course, and my father had a long, lifelong friendship. And one of the reasons why is they actually liked each other. Even though they had a different political philosophy, they would have dinner at each other's houses, they'd go over, they, had, they attended family functions of, each, of one another. And, uh, you know, my, uh, Warren Hatch, Senator Warren Hatch, uh, you know, told the story of the night before my father died. Well, it, first of all, Warren Hatch, who was, a, of course, a long, long time serving Republican, uh, you know, came to my, when my grandmother Rose died, uh, at 104, he came to my grandmother's funeral. And a couple of years later, when Warren Hatch's mother died, now she was, uh, the, her funeral ceremony was in uh, out about a two hour drive outside of Salt Lake City, it took a day to get there and a day to get back. Uh, but when Warren Hatch walked into that church, who was sitting in the front row? But my father. Okay, so that's the, just an example. Do you see what I'm saying about how he was able to develop the kind of relationships that enabled him to be so successful legislatively is by developing, and maybe to the Irish, this sounds kind of elementary, okay, but uh, to, to, to Americans, I'm telling you, there is a fundamental breakdown right now in Washington. No one can get anything done. And part of the reason why is people don't try to get to know each other and try to get to know one another's point of view. So the first thing that my father uh, really thought about in, and could observe when he was growing up, he, he talks about the constant state of catching up. The constant state of catching up. And, and, and talking about how he was the youngest of nine and how his family competed in everything. He said, we competed in every conceivable way, at touch football, at sailing, at skipping rocks, and seeing whose seashell could float the farthest out to sea. We competed in games of wit and information and debate. We competed for attention at the dinner table, which meant a good deal of boning up. Entry stakes for those conversations amounted to a substantial mastery of the topic under discussion. It is no accident that copious research and preparation have defined my methods as a senator. I will not champion a bill or cause, no matter how com complex, until I have understood it well enough to satisfy the standards of my father that my father set for table talk. And I think this is reflective, I think, on my father's approach to a, a particular issue. You know, he's, he's known for the work that he's done on health care. 
course, that was something he felt strongly about, that every person, especially in a country as wealthy as America, uh, deserved fundamental uh, health care protections. Um, but the, the reality was, he just was a student of health care, and he knew more about health care than anybody else, so that when he walked into a room, or they were trying to do one of these compromises on a bill, he could run circles around all the other senators because they were concentrating on defense or some other type of issue, right? So they would almost, uh, they, you know, they would refer to him, and if he, he, he could basically dominate the conversation because he was so knowledgeable. Um, and, and then he says, competition, of course, is the route to achievement in America. As I think back to my three brothers and how and, and about what they had accomplished before I was even out of my childhood, it, it occurred to me that my entire life has been an entire state of catching up. So as the youngest of nine children, that's what he was faced with. Um, by catching up, I mean my own life, I mean with my own life and with members of my family. I don't mean that I felt envious of any of them. I loved and respected every single one. I mean that they set an extraordinary high standard of life in general, and particularly in public service. So, so from the very beginning, I started really getting behind the eight ball. My brothers and sisters were already on a very fast track. So I think that they did set a high, and they loved each other, even though they competed with each other, they loved each other uh, very, very much. It's been said that when they would all go to a party together, uh, my father and his brothers and sisters, they'd all go to a party together and then they just stand there and talk to each other. <laughs> and, and people are like, what, wait a second. And, and, but it's, it, it's true, they loved each other's company. They just wanted to spend time with each other all the time. My father also talked about his faith. And uh, for those of you who were, who were here last night for my cousin Rory's uh, film, Ethel, that was terrific, wasn't it? Um, yeah. You know, it talked about how Ethel was a daily communicant, but that she never talked about. It's not something my family ever really talked about. Um, but, you know, both of my father's parents were very religious, and my father was very religious. Um, and this is, was uh, the, the, the passage that was on my father's mass card when he died. Um, he says, my own, my own center of belief, as I matured and grew curious about these things, moved towards the great gospel of Matthew, chapter 25 especially, in which he calls us to care for the least of these among us, and feed the hungry, clothe the naked, give drink to the thirsty, welcome the stranger, visit the imprisoned, it is enormously significant to me that the only description in the Bible about salvation is tied to one's willingness to act on behalf of one's fellow human beings. So I think that that really did, you know, somehow in his Irish Catholic upbringing, okay, he was imbued with this sense, this sense that that is really what we're put on the planet for. Um, and I think that it really did guide him in much of his uh, you know, political life and his personal life. Um, you know, uh, I, I, growing up, my father talks about it in this book, and growing up, I remember my grandmother Rose talking about her experience as an Irish American. And I reflected on some of these at the homestead uh, just last night. Um, but, you know, my grandmother Rose, of course, she grew up, Rose Fitzgerald is the daughter of Mayor John F. Fitzgerald. He was uh, the mayor of Boston, many of you know, over 100 years ago. She grew up as the mayor's daughter. His wife did not like politics, so my grandmother would accompany him to all of his political events. And it was very, uh, there, were, there were a lot of events and a lot of social, uh, socializing with other people. That's how politics was done in those days. Um, yet even though she was beautiful, even though she was smart, and even though she grew up as the daughter of the mayor of Boston, she was still shut out of all the uh, fancy uh, uh, clubs and parties that were taking place. She, um, she was trying to get into a number of literary societies that were all dominated by the uh, Protestant Brahmin, Waspy um, uh, elite in Boston that controlled everything and they wouldn't let her join. 
And, um, and that was a part of her experience. She would tell us when we were uh, growing up about the, the discrimination faced by the Irish in Boston. And I think that it was very important. Um, in fact, my father in this passage talks about my grandfather um, feeling like he was never fully accepted into Boston society. And he's, and this is my father I'm quoting from, yet even as he marched through one invisible barricade after another, after he had achieved significant, you know, uh, uh, social and economic success. My father, my, this is dad, speaking my father, talking about his father, always understood that he was never completely accepted as an equal by the old Yankee stock. He would always be a, quote, Irish Catholic first and an individual second. My, my grandfather said, I was born here, my parents were born here, what the hell do I have to do to be called an American? He blurted out after yet one more paper referred to him as an Irishman. In 1922, he was turned down for membership in a country club on Boston's South Shore, and years later complained that the Protestant elite would not accept his daughters as debutantes. He bought the home in Hyannisport only after realizing he could not gain entry into a more exclusive neighborhood. And that's true. The reason that my family settled in Hyannisport, Massachusetts, is because they wouldn't let him in to the country club in Cohasset. That is the reason. And the, and the country club in Hyannisport was run by an Irish Catholic. Okay, my grandparents wanted to play golf. That's one thing they wanted to do. So um, I think, you know, the religious issue, I think, is a, a, a such an interesting issue. Um, in fact, um, there was a book that was recently written by a historian named David Nassau called The Patriarch. That was a, a biography of my father's. It's out right now. And, you know, he talks about the Catholic issue and the religious issue. Those of you who are old enough to remember when John F. Kennedy was president, that was like the dominating issue for that presidential campaign. Um, and in, uh, my grandfather says, talks about in a letter to a friend, and it, it was, it, it, so it's, it's kind of fast forward now to, and now John F. Kennedy has won the Democratic nomination, and all that they're talking about is his Catholicism. So John, Joseph Kennedy says to a letter to a friend, listen, he went to Choate and Harvard, he nearly lost his life in military service, he was elected to national office five times. He served 13 years in Washington. He's now identified not as the, quote, best qualified candidate, but as the Catholic candidate. And this just drove my grandfather crazy. Um, and Jack actually made several important speeches about the separation of church and state and um, how his public and personal positions would never be determined by church doctrine. Um, and he thought that he pretty much laid it out. It's interesting that even uh, in the most recent presidential election, when Mitt Romney was running for president, okay, this is 50 years after JFK, uh, this country had to confront this issue, uh, Mitt Romney, who was a Mormon, also had to deal with that very same issue. 50 years later, so I'm not sure our country is really fully past that. We'd like to think we are. We elected an African-American president, but I'm not so sure. I think it would be actually an interesting thing for the, the Kennedy Summer School to talk about it because, you know, it's interesting that David Nassau argues in his book how the Catholic Church itself nearly cost JFK the election. How? Because when prominent church leaders, bishops and cardinals, basically said that JFK was wrong after he made these speeches, talking about the separation, absolute separation of church and state, and how he would never take orders from Rome, and how his uh, religion was his own personal belief, and he would not try to impose that on anybody else. All the Catholic hierarchy in the United States said would write these letters to the editor that published in all the newspapers saying, you know what, JFK has it wrong, okay? That is not the teaching of the Catholic Church, they said. 
They said that, it, and so my, my, of course, my family was going bananas, okay, because they're thinking, like, oh, you would think that, the, 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 at this point, that the Catholic Church would be thrilled that a Catholic was about to be elected uh, as president of the United States, but in fact, it was more complicated than that. They said that a Catholic cannot, quote unquote, compartmentalize his or her faith in such a way and call it a private matter. You can't do that, they said. Religion is never a private matter, they said. Always, it always has a bearing on a politician's actions in public service. So then, of course, everyone else said, we told you so, right? <laughs> this is exactly what we're saying, and now the, the Catholic Church itself is saying, feeding in, of course, to every all the fears that people have, okay? So the, the reality is that many of the church hierarchy um, did not think that JFK was really a very good Catholic. Honestly, uh, they didn't want him to be the representative of Catholicism in the United States. Um, and it, it really fit into everyone's belief and concern that the Pope would rule America. So I think that it would be a, a very interesting um, uh, topic of conversation for the a future uh, Kennedy Summer School. Just what, a, what impact did that have and where are we now? So uh, discrimination against the Irish was something that my father uh, spoke about. Um, I just have a couple more things. I know the hour is late. I'm be standing in between you and dinner, but but I wanted to also uh, uh, talk about the, the greatest moment of my father's life. Okay, greatest moment of my father's life was uh, when he scored a football, uh, when he scored a touchdown at the Yale Harvard game. Okay, uh, when he was in college and. Um, he, uh, and my father always worked very, very hard and talked about perseverance. In fact, his book, the working title of this book for, for a long time was Perseverance. That, before he decided to name it True Compass, it was Perseverance. Uh, and that word just really epitomized um, my father's life. But the reason why it was so important to him is because uh, he says the most exciting personal moment came at the Harvard Yale game because his father was sitting there in the stands watching the whole thing, okay? So, came at the Harvard Yale game when a pass came skidding off the hands of its intended receiver, and I reached out and grabbed it and hung onto it as I rumbled into the end zone. I won my letter, but we lost the game. See, Harvard ended up winning 21 to seven. So, even though my father had the greatest moment of his life, they ended up losing the game. <laughs> Uh, this this uh, this time almost everyone at Harvard was down in the dumps, but not everyone. Dad, who brought up a couple dozen of his friends from New York and Boston by train, charged into the locker room with Jack and Bobby to noisily congratulate me. I I knew they should have toned it down, but Dad and my brothers were smiling so broadly over my TV catch and earning my letter. I can't say I was sorry for their enthusiasm. <laughs> so he, um, you know, my father in his book he talks about always trying, and that he was he wasn't the best football player on the team, but he showed up early, he worked late, and he persevered. Um, he tried harder than anybody else. Um, one of the things, and one of my really my favorite stories, is um, the role that my grandmother played in the Cuban Missile Crisis. <laughs> Some of you may know this, uh, this story, uh, but you see my grandmother, what she loved to do uh, is give, uh, uh, give signed copies of books to people as Christmas presents and as birthday presents. So if somebody published a new book, she would get the author to inscribe it and she would give it as a, as a present. So, uh, that she loved to do that, especially with you know famous authors and stuff like that. So at the height of the standoff, when nuclear warfare uh, remained a live option on both sides, this is I'm quoting again from my father's book. The head of the KGB in Moscow burst through the door of Khrushchev's office. He carried a letter to the Soviet Soviet premier from one Rose Fitzgerald Kennedy of Hyannisport. Mrs. Kennedy wanted the premier 
to autograph some of his books. <laughs> The transatlantic cables hung with this baffling new development. This is in the middle of the humanist crisis. My grandmother sends a letter to Grusha asking him to sign. Okay. Of course, the KGB were trying to, they had every uh, an analyst trying to figure out what does this mean? What is the, what is the message that the Kennedys are trying to send them? And they're trying to decipher this sentence. And they, they have like, you know, 300 people racking their brains. You know, what, what, what is this communicating? Okay. The transatlantic cables hung with this baffling new development. And actually, the CIA got involved too. When Jack, when Jack found out about it, he called up our mother and demanded, What in the world are you doing? Rose assumed that Jack knew very well what she was doing. Each Christmas, mother made it a practice to give her children books signed by heads of state. This year, it was Mr. Khrushchev's turn. She had methodically forged ahead according to her schedule. The Russians won't assume this is innocent, Jack sputtered. They'll give it some interpretation. Now I have to get my CIA people speculating on what that interpretation might be. Uh, the kicker is that after the threat of World War III had been diffused, Khrushchev did send Mother the autograph book. <laughs> So glad that that story was in, uh, you know, was you know made it into his um, uh, 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 book. Just a couple of other really funny stories, um, and I think that the people that, uh, in politics will really love this story because it, it, it talks about one of the very first experiences that my father had as a United States senator, senator when he just arrived in Washington D.C. and was listening to debates on different subjects and always trying to figure out, well, what position I vote? Yeah, well, that guy had a oh, very good, oh, well, this person had sound pretty good. And trying to figure out how he was going to vote on a particular issue. And he talks about this experience he had with a Willis Robertson of Virginia, who was the father of the TV evangelist Pat Robertson, who's a big uh, television uh, evangelist in, in the United States. So. Dad talks about, I walked into a Senate debate and listened to Senator Robertson speak very ardently in favor of a certain bill, the contents of which eludes me now. Then the time came for the roll call. Impressed with the Virginia Senator's passion, I cast an I vote when my turn came. When the call got to Robertson, he voted no. <laughs> I couldn't believe my ears. I went up to him afterwards and said, Senator, I don't understand. I just listened to your speech on this issue, and you spoke very strongly in favor of it. Then you voted no. I'm confused. Robertson smiled at me, and he said, well, Senator, you see, it's very simple. In my state, the people are evenly divided on this issue. <laughs> to those who favor it, I send them a copy of my speech. <laughs> if they're opposed, I send them a copy of my vote. <laughs> that was one of my fathers. Um, I, I really love that story. Um, uh, I just, there's two more stories I'd like to read. One of them is uh, on how my father talked about perseverance. He talks about it as uh, the, the, the real critical element in life, okay? Whether it's work, whatever it is that you're undertaking, things never come easy. Maybe it's in our culture today where people just think, well, I can start an internet company and be a millionaire in three years, you know? There is something, at least in American culture, where the, the idea that you have to spend your life working hard towards certain goals it is really eroding. Um, and he talks, of, this talks about a story of actually about my son, uh, who's Teddy the Third. 
And he says, uh, talks about how little Teddy spent the summer in Hyannisport working hard on his sailing. As he told me one evening, his father passed sailing on to him just as I had passed it on to his father. It was a Kennedy tradition to sail. The problem was, was that throughout July, nothing seemed to go right with little Ted, Teddy sailing, and he wasn't having very much fun. He would race his boat and come in last or second to last. He would swim <coughs> his boat and spend time bailing it out. He was often miserable and shed a few, well, more than a few tears. Again, this is my dad talking about my son. But his father and I encouraged him, keep sailing, try this technique, don't give up. I told Teddy of my being on the eighth string at the Harvard football team and how I was not the best athlete by far, but I stayed with it and I didn't give up. And in my senior year, I was a starter and caught touchdown passes. His face seemed to light up. We, not, may, we might not be the best, Teddy, but we can work harder than anyone, everyone else, I told him, and that will make the difference, okay? And he goes on to talk about how my, how my son later won the August series, but he was, my father really believed in sticking to something uh, through and through. And again, in this culture, at least in the U.S., where people have seven jobs by the time they turn 30 years old. Um, you know, there's not a sense of, of, of just sticking with something. Finally, I have one just final uh, uh, note about Northern Ireland. And my father talks about the Irish in his book and about the work in Northern Ireland that I just wanted to conclude with. Um, uh, and he talks about his, at the, one of the few areas of agreement that he had with President Carter was on the issue of Northern Ireland. But he talks about the North. And he says, quote, British rule of the Protestant North and the marginalization of the Catholic minority there was, of course, an ancient and seemingly settled fact of history. It traced back at least as far as 1690, when the invading King William III of England and Scotland war down the Catholic Jacobites at the Battle of the Boyne. The harsh peace terms that followed ensured British control over the six county north and bitter resentments among the conquered Catholics for centuries to come. The partition of 1921 led to Catholic civil disobedience in the north, which morphed into violence, which in turn provoked savage reprisals by the Protestants. A cycle of death and devastation took hold with arson, bombings, and shooting, shredding the fabric of civilized life, <coughs> the Irish Republican Army then turned into a Catholic nationalistic paramilitary force and waged a decades-long battle to end British rule in Northern Ireland. Now, I'm not telling, obviously, all of you in this audience know that story. Um, but my father felt, you know, his evolution also of his thinking on issues as our, in the beginning, it was, uh, you know, fairly simplistic, Brits out type of, of political viewpoint. In fact, in 1972, after Bloody Sunday, many people here in this audience remember my father sponsored a resolution in the Senate calling for a complete withdrawal of British troops from Northern Ireland and establishing a united Ireland. Um, but over the years, his his uh, philosophy and his and his, and his uh, understanding of the situation in Ireland changed, and a lot of it had to do with his relationship with John Hume. There were a lot of other uh, uh, people, well, not just John Hume, but I think um, he was very impressed with with John Hume's belief in nonviolence. And this is my father talking about John. He believed in the political process rather than the bomb and the bullet and that different traditions should be able to work out their differences through mutual respect. Unlike those of us who said that the first step was for the British to withdraw troops, John believed that the ultimate resolution of the conflict would come through political evolution rather than unilateral actions by any one of the parties. So he talks about his, his evolution of his thinking um, and the fact that he called in, in uh, uh, later on, in 1977, he called for Americans to stop romanticizing the Irish Republican Army and quit sending the money through Norway. Um, so even though my dad enraged 
uh, successive British governments and unionists by highlighting human rights abuses, uh, he also remained an opponent of IRA violence. Um, and later in his memoir, he recounts details surrounding the issuance of the visa to Jerry Adams, which was, of course, very politically risky and controversial at the time, a uh, diplomatic maneuver. Uh, but most historians today, including Mr. Adams himself, now view this as a crucial step in the path uh, of the Good Friday Agreement and acknowledge my father's behind the scenes role in making that happen, despite strong opposition at the time from the U.S. State Department, the U.S. Justice Department, and the British government itself, who of course viewed Mr. Adams uh, as a terrorist. So, and even when the ceasefire was broken, and the assembly was suspended. Uh, Dad uh, continued to work with both unionists and nationalists to reinstate them and to maintain the hope of power sharing, peace, and, and, and perseverance. And that's just another example of how, uh, you know, my father, I could go on and on, I won't, uh, but that's just another example of how my father's uh, perseverance, he was, uh, he, he was willing to uh, keep new information and take in new information and also change his mind uh, if, if he got some new information. And I think that was one of his uh, successes uh, as a, as a uh, uh, politician. So obviously I could go on and on. I won't, I think this has uh, uh, just been a terrific um, uh, a seminar and academy to study all these different things and to learn uh, from different people, and uh, I want to again thank the new. I want to thank the Kennedy Summer School, Noel, and Peter. I want to thank you for all of your leadership. And again, I think my family. Uh, I speak for all of the Kennedy family when I say that we are so impressed with the caliber of individuals who are making the JFK Trust, uh, the Edward M. Kennedy Institute, uh, and the Kennedy Summer School. Uh, such an amazing uh, forum for public policy debate. Thank you so much.
that he still has such energy for reform. And I see him more as a minister for the reform of education, both at primary level, when you emphasize the separation of church and state and providing for greater choice, uh, at second level, talking about access, reforming the uh, leaving cert, and also higher education, and again, the moves he's making to reform higher education. And I think that while we often see once-off things, like a Minister for Education bringing in pre-second level education as being a big area of reform, I think in years to come, we look at this period now of what's happening quietly in some ways, but also with the people involved in education to bring about reform, we will see this as a period of major reform of the Irish education system. And it gives me great pleasure, therefore, to ask the Minister to respond to the address that we've just heard. Thank you very much, uh, Peter, for that introduction, and thank you for both yourself and Noel giving me the honor to make this address to you and to the Kennedy memory and to all of the interconnections that we've had. Uh, with the Kennedys over so many generations. But I have to start with Wexford. Uh, some of you might know this, most of you probably don't, that the beloved Brendan Corish of my memory was my great <clears throat> political, not mentor, but sponsor. And when I was a very rebellious young student in Labour Party conferences, Peter might recall some of this, he used to get up out of his seat in Liberty Hall and wander around and he would sit down with the delegates, free television, all that kind of stuff. And I had led a delegation from UCD. And he said, uh, I'd like you to give a tribute to the chairperson of the conference. Uh, and this was a signal on him. And I said, thank you very much, Brandon, but I, I, I couldn't honestly do it. And he said, well, why? I said, because I think Jimmy Tully has been a bully, and he's been a lousy chairman of the conference. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, OK. But he reminded me afterwards about that conversation when he said, Brendan, Hall uh, Brendan Halligan has been in elected in the by-election to the Doyle vacancy. That frees up a seat in the Senate. And in 1974, uh, no, 1976, he said, I want to appoint you to the Senate. And I worked very closely with him. And I subsequently worked very closely with a very young man called Senator Brendan Hull, your current deputy, who asked me to apologize to you on his behalf because he would have wanted to be here tonight, indeed possibly to give this address, but he's in China earning his living on all of our behalves. But let me share a political story with you, which I think might resonate with the Teddy Kenny that you talked about. We, the Labour Party, went into government with Fianna Fáil in 1992, doing the incomprehensible, unacceptable type of deal, um, of which I was very much in favour. The numbers made it necessary, but I wanted to break the automatic link that had Fianna Fáil on one side and Fine Gael and the Labour Party on the other. And we started the negotiations uh, that happened, myself and Brendan were on the negotiating team, and after two years that <coughs> alliance fell apart. And um, there was great uncertainty, and we started to explore the possibility of an alliance again with a new leader of the Nepal, and that broke down, and then we were out again. In the meantime, after many years of marriage, second marriage, my wife produced our long sought son, Conan, who was the 19 in October, and uh, she was at home and had been more or less difficult enough for her to say, what time are you going to be home tonight, and so on and so forth. All of you have been through that kind of thing. So I went in determined that uh, this was the last night of negotiation. We're going to do it tonight, no matter what it was. There were three parties involved. We were kind of, I was kind of chairing it, but not officially, but steering it certainly, and very determined. And I went into the members' bar. You were allowed to smoke in those days. And I said, I want a packet of cigar uh, cigars. And I said, give me three packets. <laughs> and uh, it's going to be a long night. Brendan came in after me. He said, you're not smoking those, are you? And I said, I am. He said, but you can't smoke them. I said, Peck off, you're not Minister for Health anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so 
We got into the negotiations, <coughs> and again, I could see the exit door, see us going, and getting home and doing all the sort of things I had to do. Conan was four or five weeks old. And um, the next minute, Richard Rubin, who's a very, very gentle man, my current colleague and Minister for, Edu for Enterprise and Employment, and uh, he said, what about this issue now? Well, well, we have to dis discuss this one. I said, we really have discussed it. I said, you know, stop raising this very I was losing it. And he said, look, we haven't discussed this. And um, he said, well, we and then how about it? No, we haven't discussed it. Then I got a kick on the ankle from Brendan Howard, who was taking the notes. He said, we did discuss it, but with the other crowd, not this crowd. <laughs> <laughs> I had the great honour and, and pleasure of meeting Ted Kennedy as a new colleague. And uh, what struck me after the, the normal, expansive political sort of engagement and all the ways that, which is much more extrovert, I think, amongst American politicians than it is amongst Irish and European politicians, was behind this apparent showbiz uh, engagement was a detailed knowledge. The perseverance that you referred to. Because I had been Minister for Labour and I had introduced a programme called the Social Employment Scheme. In fact, it was showcased and modelled here at the Model County uh, with Noel Dillon, who was then the county manager. Uh, and we developed programmes together here in Wexford back in the 1982-84 period. <laughs> and he knew about it because he was looking at this attack. He knew about um, what we were doing, what I was trying to do. He had, somebody had done research. <coughs> Somebody's gone from this extrovert kind of engagement to about the problem that you did about eggs. Where did you get that idea from? How did this come about? Blah, 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 blah. And I said, well, you know, a lot of it was generated by social democratic labor market measures that the Swedes in the 1930s had introduced, but also by what President Roosevelt had done, uh, FG, the, the Franklin D. Roosevelt uh, in the 1930s, in, in the depths of depression. And I said, what I really took from it was some of the programs for unemployed artists of one kind or another. And with that, I just opened up and said, yeah, did you do this? And have you read James Adji's um, novel, Let Us Now Speak of Famous Men, and the photographic stuff that was done in the 1930s? And that iconic photograph of the deep, deep depression <clears throat> and the hunger in the dust bowl of a mother with a child leaning on her shoulder. So that was the kind of man I experienced of, of, of Ted. He was expansive, engaged, very happy, very, very concerned about the Irish question. Uh, and from the very first time that I met him, and I met him, I'd say, probably about five or six and up in all. And he had that ability to pick up a conversation as if he'd just gone out of the room and come back again. And even though it was two, three, four, five years. And his knowledge of the details of stuff was quite, quite extraordinary. Um, and of course, I was enthralled because I was 17 in June of 1963. And this was a very isolated country in 1963. Uh, European Union existed, but we weren't part of it. My father was a Northern Irish Catholic who was born in Liverpool. My grandfather had re returned to, what, not to the place where he was born, it was the hill farm above Kilkeel, uh, but to Newry had started to build a big business there. My grandfather that was. <clears throat> and my father and his brothers grew up in a biggish sort of family like you talked about. And the 1916 arrived. My father described to me how, as a young boy, he was about 13 years of age, and if you know the road to Newry, uh, pre the, the motorway, there's a long hill decline into Newry town. There's a church on the right hand side that just started. And he told me how, as a youngster, having uh, heard about the insurrection in Dublin in 1916, he walked up this long road as a 13 year old, sat on the hill beside St. Melinia's Church, and waited for what he expected to be a marching troop of uniformed Irish. Uh, soldiers coming to liberate the North. Uh, and of course it didn't happen like that. But he was interested in politics. And in our house, not unlike yours, uh, it used to, every Sunday, and my mother and father were the first of their families to live in Dublin, as is the case with so many of our generation. 
And we had cousins and people who would come, as my mother said, her brother-in-law, my uncle Kevin, came for the weekend and stayed 10 years. <laughs> and every Sunday when you had your dinner in the middle of the day in those days, uh, it took us about a half an hour to finish the meal and two hours to complete the argument, whatever the argument of the day happened to be. So a disputatious household, and one where you had to be able to grab a space to make the intervention and hold up that intervention long enough. And my two older brothers would attempt to not be out of that spot. So I can empathize with what you were reading from the ex excerpts from the book, True Compass, which incidentally to any of you here is a wonderfully informative book. It has the whole range of emotions and experiences and I strongly, strongly recommend it. I had the honor incidentally to do the review of it for the Irish Times. Um, when, when it was published, I mean, you say, it came out very soon after its death. But the, the idea of engaging in politics, of learning your trade, it is a trade, and a long apprenticeship is necessary. It looks easy, like so many things. I remember Gay Byrne, those of you who will remember, famous interview he had with a neighboring singer from the next county, uh, Val Junikin. And Gay turned around to him after Val gave him one of his performances, and he was now a big star in Britain. And he said, well, Val, you're, you're an overnight success in Britain, aren't you? And he said, yeah, I'm at 20 years an overnight success. <laughs> he had been working his, his way along the, the line. I think you've raised a very interesting thing because your reference to John F. Kennedy, uh, and I remember, like a lot of us, kind of, of our age, I can tell you exactly where I was in the 20. 2nd, 23rd of November, when the news came through. And it was as if the, the prince had been killed, that the future had been wiped out, that a possibility that opened up, for me certainly, and for so many Irish people who were so proud that one of our own, by whatever generation, had got to a point which suddenly made everything else possible for the rest of us. And for, certainly for me and for my generation, and I think for successive generations, the achievement that the Kennedys found for themselves in America was an achievement that any Irish immigrant could find for itself in any part of the world. There was a, and the fascination with politics that comes with that, uh, there was a British ex-MP, Labour MP, uh, who became a TV star called um, Help me if I'm got the name right here. Kilroy Silk. Charles or David Kilroy Silk. Kilroy Silk was his name. And he made some very disparaging, nasty comments about President Mary Robinson. And uh, the Spectator magazine, which would normally be a supporter of the Conservative Party and therefore not a great admirer of Kilroy Silk, he said, You know, you really need to be very careful about the Irish and politics. You just can't criticize the Irish president, because there are three Irish presidents and four Irish prime ministers. And everybody reads and says, what's this about? So then the article pointed out that, of course, there was President Mary Robinson, but there was um, also President Herzog in Israel, who was born in Ireland, and there was President Reagan, who would love to have been born in Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but found outside Tipperary, somebody that would certainly celebrate him. And there was uh, Prime Minister Brian Mulroney from Canada, and the Prime Minister Paul Keating in Australia, and Prime Minister whose people left this county um, back in the 1930s. Jim Bulger, I think was his name. So here, the, the engagement, the fascination, the participation in politics, I think, is and the interest in it, is shared by so many people. Let me just turn to the last point I want to make, and again, thank you for a really, really scintillating and engaging and enjoyable, warm, but also thoughtful presentation. You talked about the separation of church and state and that whole Kennedy bit. That will resonate with the audience here in a way that perhaps you're not necessarily up to speed because... Uh, Did I say something? Uh, <laughs> it, 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 
Uh, you know what I'm going to talk about. Um, we had a very contentious issue, an issue where people just simply disagree. Finding them in the ground becomes nearly impossible, and you have to respect the intensity and the uh, sincerity of the positions that are held. And it was about finally dealing with a Supreme Court ruling around the issue of abortion. And for so many years, it, it hadn't been dealt with. Uh, it, it was a legal vacuum that had become law, but there was no statutory legislation for it. And as a lawyer, it was a Supreme Court judgment that said yes in certain limited circumstances, but no previous law could, could bring itself to, to deal with it. And the leader of the Dugail Party, which many people would have thought was close, more closely aligned to a, a Catholic um, point of view in this country than others, uh, Andrew Kenny, President Taoiseach, decided to, to deal with this issue as part and parcel of an agreement with the government. And I couldn't help but think that so many of the things that you described about JFK and the Cardinals coming in and the bishops writing and the various statements and about the obligations of can you have a private faith in a public position, all of those things I think Professor Ann Harris could today, or Ann Ryan, uh, could be for a future Kennedy Summer School, something that might usefully uh, be explored. I'm not sure that we'd come up with an agreed answer, but we'd have great fun arguing about it. Um, can I finish uh, by saying thank you, Kiki, for being here. Uh, I didn't get a chance to meet your cousin, Rory, but I did tell you the incident outside. That when I was growing up in Sandy Mountain Down, the only other Rory that I knew was a red setter Irish dog. <laughs> <laughs> And then when I heard that Bobby and Anthony Kennedy had named their last child, I think, who was a daughter, also Rory, I really was confused. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's so great, it's such a great honour for us to have you here, and I'm most delighted and pleased to have been able to respond to your wonderful, wonderful contribution. Thank you. for those personal reflections of your own both uh, intimate knowledge of Ted Kennedy and involvement with him. Um, interesting enough, when you talked about being uh, bullied by Jimmy Tully, I can just say to you that uh, the Kennedy Institute of Minute has a certificate in conflict resolution and education. So if you want to sign up for uh, the program on conflict resolution and education, we'd be quite happy to accommodate you. Now, we are making arrangements because we have a few minutes where I will take two or three uh, questions from the audience, but while we're waiting for the first question to come through, can I just ask um, you one, Ted, or Teddy, as I've taken the following you now, where you mentioned earlier about um, people with disabilities, and I know you're involved in the National Association of America. And in Ireland at the moment, there is a lot of movement now towards trying not just to have better services for people with disabilities, but also the notion of indicating their rights in terms of independence and that. So I'm not asking you to, as were, give us advice as to what we should do, but just in that sense of where you think Ireland should be looking to as to how you move towards giving a greater independence for people with disabilities. Well, thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Peter. Ooh, I thought my speaking was over. <laughs> can I tell a funny story before I answer that question? Honey, can I tell my gay bird story? <laughs> I'm not answering the question. Would people like to hear my story? <laughs> I, first of all, I want to introduce my, my wife, Kiki. Kiki, will you please stand up? This is actually her second trip to New Ross this year. She was here when this city uh, welcomed other members of my family early, earlier this year. And when I told her I got an invitation to come back, to come to New Ross and participate, in the Kennedy uh, Summer School, uh, she said, can I come too? So, uh, so honey, thank you for coming again. But this story actually involves uh, 
that actually involves my wife. So I'm I'm Gay Byrne. He was on you know he was the, the kind of the Johnny Carson of of, of Irish television. And I was here uh, for Daffodil Day. Do they still have this? Yeah. Is Irish Cancer Society still? I was invited. This is, I don't know, 15 years ago or so? 18. So this is why I will forever be married. <laughs> it's got my memory back. I'm sitting there in the front row. So, so I get invited on the Gay Burn Show. I, 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 I apologize if I'm going a little off well, script here. Interesting. So, <laughs> and actually this does relate to disability in a, in a funny way. So I am talking to Gay Burn, and, and I, he's talking, of course, about my, many of you know my story, how I lost my leg to bone cancer. I was 12 years old and whatnot. And Gay Burn, and it's a lot of my television, right? Uh, at the time where I think it was the only thing on TV at like 11 o'clock at night in Ireland. So people didn't have a choice. They had to watch me. So, so anyway, uh, I'm, he's, 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 uh, finally he says, uh, well, there's somebody else in the audience uh, we'd like to introduce. And this camera on the boom comes over and fo focuses right in on my wife. Okay. Now she's sitting in the audience like she's doing right now. And of course, now the camera is right, sitting right in front of my wife. And he says, listen, uh, you know, we've just heard from your husband. You know, he's such a remarkable man. You know, he lost his leg, but that doesn't stop him. He does everything. He sails, he swims, he skis. I mean, he's just so remarkable that everything he does in his life, is there anything, anything at all that your husband doesn't do? <laughs> Waiting, what the hell is going to come out of my wife's mouth? And, and Pinky looks at looks straight at Burn, Gray Burn, and says, "Well, actually, he doesn't take out the garbage." <laughs> That's what she said. He doesn't take the garbage out. Okay. Well, you would have thought that I had set off a revolution okay, because. I, I found out later that actually in Ireland, actually taking the garbage out is, is actually supposed to be the men's man's yeah. job. Is that true? Yeah. Yes. yes. So, so and, and Kiki explained, you know, he comes home, it's late, you got to put the garbage out, it's usually around 11 or 12 o'clock, he's already taken off his artificial leg. And so I'm the one who takes the garbage out and puts it on the side of the road. She's explaining to Gay Burn. Well, I, I was at that point, at the next day, you know, I rented my car and I started my family trip around Ireland and wherever I went, <laughs> wherever I went, it was almost like I was leading the response to the feminist movement. <laughs> and, you know, I, people would say to me, Ted, you are the boss. You know, I, I admire you. You make her take out the dark. <laughs> And, and, and people were going up to my wife saying, you know, I, I don't think that's right, you know, I don't let him boss you around like that, uh, you know, you, you have rights too, and, and, and it was like, it was really funny. So that is my gay burn story. <laughs> she was going to talk about it on television. But in a more serious note, just about, you know, the area of disability, and I, and I, I touched on it just momentarily. You know, my whole family's been involved in the whole issue of, of disability rights, and I think part of it has been, um, because we've been touched by the issue, like many families around the world. Um, as you know, students of the history of the Kennedy family know my Aunt Rosemary was born with an intellectual disability my father's sister, and it really prompted uh, my aunt Eunice Shriver in particular to really be very outspoken about the rights and needs of people with disabilities in the United States. And at the time, you know, people, even when President Kennedy was elected, you know, people didn't talk about their family members with disabilities, and, and a lot of people did not bring people out in public. It was almost like a shameful thing for many families, not all. 
But, um, but the, one of the first things he did as president was establish a presidential commission. He, my grandfather s said to my uh, Uncle Jack when he became president, my grandfather said, I want two things. Bobby's going to be attorney general. <laughs> yes, Dad. <laughs> Bobby's going to be attorney general. And you're going to start a presidential commission on what they called it mental retardation at the time. On mental retardation. Okay, that was his two things my grandfather asked for. And, um, and the point was is that this had been a neglected topic, and yet it, it impacts so many families. And, and it's not a, you know, it's not a liberal or conservative issue. I think families who have faced this will tell you about the services and needs of people with, with uh, disabilities and the way that there's a lot of social stigma about disability. And so I think that um, we've come a long way. Um, and there's, there's other countries, I think the United States, because we passed our Americans with Disabilities Act, alleviating a lot of the architectural barriers. A lot of countries, including Ireland, have done a pretty good job at alleviating a lot of those intellect, uh, those uh, architectural barriers. There's other barriers, of course, that exist, chronic unemployment, et cetera. Um, but I think when I said in my remarks, you know, focusing on disability, using a civil rights approach, focusing disability not as some that people with disabilities are objects of charity. Um, people do not want uh, a handout. They want a job, they want equal opportunity, they want the right to participate in society like everybody else. Uh, and they don't want to be perceived as objects of charity, most people with disabilities. And I think that one thing, that, that's a big change, I think, in, in, in the way people with disabilities uh, perceive themselves. And you know it's going to take time, but I think that uh, I think that, that we've made a lot of progress, and uh, and you know so. Though, but it's a worldwide struggle, and all of us can take a part by when we see somebody with a disability, uh, you know, talk to them, ask them. Why. There's a lot of social isolation among people with with disabilities, and kids with disabilities tend to be bullied in school much more frequently and whatnot, and. And I think a lot of it has to do just with the ISO. There are not as many opportunities available. So all of us can, can do our part by reaching out. Okay, we have time for one or two questions from the uh, audience. This is now your, uh, your opportunity. And the question can be either to Ted, it can be to the minister, or indeed to uh, Professor Anne Ryan. So, and if, in asking the question, if people could just uh, give their name, it will make it much more social between us all if you know who uh, we're talking with and having the conversation with. So, yourself first. Good afternoon, Mr. Kennedy. My name is Tom Bryant. I'm your neighbor across the Long Island Sound. I'm also living up the Ledge Island in Kerry at the moment. And I want to, you've been so kind in sharing your memories of your dad. I want to share one with you that you may not know. Uh, my son, who was at the time nine, and I were the last, if you will, civilians uh, at Arlington the night before your father's memorial service. And uh, other than about two dozen military staffers who were going through a complete dress rehearsal for your father's service, it was purely my son Jack and I. And your father knew that I named my son after your uncle and president. And in the course of the 20 or 30 minute rehearsal, uh, my son Jack was observing the fact that the seven members of the 21 gun salute were all very emotional, and many of them were crying. And the leadership of Arlington and the major on duty, who was kind enough to let my son and I witness this, was very emotional. And my son Jack uh, said, uh, Dad, don't these men witness this, you know, daily? And I said, at the end of the service rehearsal, why don't you ask that major why he's so moved right now? I had a sense, I had a sense, but I wanted my son to learn this practice of your fathers that you would know about. So my father, uh, my son Jack went over and said, introduced himself, thanked him for us being able to be there on the hillside. And uh, the major said two things. He said, first, what's your impression, son? What's your impression, Jack, as you're here? He said, I'm the last boy who'll be on this hillside until tomorrow when all three brothers are back together. And the second thing that Jack asked the major was, don't you witness this, sir, and you're very emotional. You're weeping. And he said, as son, that's very simple. He said, frequently in my career, my 10 year career here at Arlington, uh, Senator uh, Kennedy would come up here, frequently driven him 
himself on his way home to his house in Virginia to, to attend quietly the uh, memorial services for people who had been killed in Afghanistan or before that in the Gulf War. And Jack, my son Jack said, how often did you see the senator here? And he said, I stopped counting it 50 times. So I wanted to just share with you an example of the quiet affection that your father had for people in the service. And only the people who were on those hillsides on those 50 plus occasions would know what they, they know. But I want you to know how reverent everyone was that afternoon in August about what was to happen the next day and the level of dignity that they were providing to that person. And once again, what a privilege it was for me to be able to witness in person. touched on something that, you know, that uh, there were, you're right, there were, I was not aware of that, of that. I knew that dad, uh, you know, attended many of these um, uh, burials and other ceremonies, but, you know, again, I think that that, that talks about the, you know, the personal, the personal relate and, you know, calling people um, and, and just touching, you know, reaching out to people and not with fanfare, not people, stories that people will never know about. Um, and you know, I, I, I wondered, um, you know, after my father died, I wondered, you know, how I would feel about hearing stories like the one that you just shared with me, you know? Um, you know, because I grew up with my cousins and people would come up to them and they'd say, oh, you know, I remember your father and I did that and I, And you know, I, I wondered, is this just a, Reminder, do you, are you making people kind of re-experience the, the, the sadness? And, uh, and you know, for me, um, it's not sad at all to hear stories like that. It's actually wonderful for me. So it's a gift to me. So thank you for that gift. Um, because I love hearing about, you know, those wonderful tender things uh, that I wouldn't know about otherwise. So thank you for sharing that with me. Summer <laughs> my, name is, my name is Patrick C. Kennedy, PCK, and I'm very proud of it. Now, when I was in your father's office in Washington, on the wall was Kate Mulevoch, and there was another sign for Lop Corp in County Limerick. I would like to say it on my own behalf, and I'm sure on behalf of everybody here, and all of the Irish nation, Katie and Apache, to yourself and Katie, and your family. And as Jackie Kennedy would say, we do hope that you'll come back again and again. I'm very impressed. I would like to say, and I would be as brief as I can, but we are very grateful indeed uh, for the story and the eloquent uh, lecture that you're giving us, uh, a memorial lecture. In, in, uh, in, in, to honor, and we want to share in that honor, the great Senator Edward Moore Kennedy. We are delighted, of course, to know that not alone have we been Teddy, and yourself as little Teddy, but we also have little Teddy. And we wish him well, and your family as well. The Kennedys over these years have personified and epitomized all that is best, summed up in the true compass, in, the, in that phrase, perseverance. We can add also, as your dad would, faith, hope, renewal, goals and dreams. And he always exhorted us, and President Kennedy exhorted us, to dream things that never were and say, why not? I would like to ask you one pertinent question in relation to the area of disability. I'm very pleased that Patrick Kennedy, your brother, is taking a special interest in the area of the brain. And there's a very important phrase that's been used now, the aging brain does not need to wait. And I would like to say that I know he is a great visitor to Kinsale. I'm a Limerick man, but I have a place in Kinsale. I would be very anxious to cooperate in this great venture that he's now, uh, that he is now about to come. 
and uh, we would like to keep in touch with you. Uh, I'm embarrassed for myself, I know you're a lawyer, and we, we will do those things. You give us a fantastic interview to Sean O'Rourke on radio uh, yesterday. But you're especially welcome also because of John Hume. John Hume is perhaps the greatest politician we ever had since Daniel O'Connor. You're very welcome. We're delighted to have you. You have very good taste, a lovely, beautiful wife, and all of these things. And of course, the Kennedys deserve only the best. Thank you. That was so eloquent and so well stated. I'm wondering, do you do you have your own public relations firm? Can I, can I hire you to be my personal representative here in Ireland? I I could but do have one recommendation that if you're interested in hearing about my brother Patrick's important work in the area of the brain, in the area of expanding opportunities and the rights of people with mental illness, that you invite him to come and speak at next year's Kennedy <laughs> Summer School. I'm sure you would be delighted to come and tell you about the work that he's doing uh, around the world on this important issue. But can I say this? Uh, be prepared. It was handed for the Senate. I would go on campus. <laughs> Earlier, uh, Ted said he didn't want to come between you and your dinner, and I'm wise enough to know that I'm not going to come between a man who doesn't go out the garbage, or he does ask, when does happy hour start? So I'm not going to come between you at happy hour, so I'm going to wrap this session uh, up now. Uh, and before thanking our, our speakers, I want to also thank uh, some of the organizers. First of all, in particular, as you have done, and uh, Noel Beeland as director of the summer school. Sean Reedy of the JK Trust. And the only great woman in the background is the trust of Mary French, who again, in my interaction with this uh, summer school, has done an enormous amount of work. And also within the Kennedy Institute, um, Anne was introduced to you earlier myself. But again, events like this don't happen without people like uh, Kieran Doyle, who's the project manager of the Edward M. Kennedy Institute. And on everyone's behalf, I want to thank him as well for allowing us to be at Labour Month. <laughs> for what's been a very, very stimulating session. Uh, Professor Anne Ryan uh, spoke to you earlier about the Institute and its commitment to the various causes that uh, your father had uh, taken an interest in. Uh, also, uh, the Minister, uh, Rory Quinn, uh, again, as I said earlier, uh, he was the obvious person, and uh, we talked about uh, Ted Ke uh, Kennedy's philosophy and who might respond, and also, of course, yourself. Uh, uh, Teddy, or Ted Kennedy Jr., and to thank you and Kiki for taking the time to come here, and also the enthusiasm with which you embrace both the new and the Institute and all of the people here in New York. So thank you very much again. Thank <laughs> you.